Hello and welcome. Pastor John here. Uh, we're looking at the Christian Basics series uh, and we're going to be dealing with the doctrine of the church today. And I want to start by reading a passage here to you from the Gospel of John. And uh, so uh, listen in. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. God bless you, you know, his word. That was John 4, verses 21 and 23. So, <clears throat> we're, talk we're talking about the church, and uh, when we look at this passage, um, uh, where Jesus is speaking with a Samaritan woman, um, we may be a bit surprised, because um, Jesus tells us that the location or place of worship doesn't matter. So what matters to Jesus is people's disposition of heart toward him. So he says, True worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. God bless the reading of his word. <clears throat> so what does that mean? Um, when we're looking at the church, what is church is the question. So as we just see and just read in the Bible, uh, church is not a building or a man-made structure, right? Um, there are some nice looking, you know, church buildings there. That's true, right? But Jesus tells us church is not a building or a man-made structure. Um, it's also not a, you know, man-made idea of one uh, singular secular institution. Uh, you know, people who may claim to have all the authority and are the only way uh, to God. That's also not true. Right? Unless what Jesus says here is false, but Jesus tells us the truth, so that's true. So church is um, basically about all, all about Jesus and his finally completed work on the cross, calling us to him uh, with humble, surrendered, obedient, and especially uh, repentant hearts. So as he's calling the Samaritan woman, oh, it's a, it's a really wonderful passage in the Bible, uh, the pericope you can read. Um, the um, we understand that church is made up of every true believer in Jesus Christ. So as together, as individuals, we comprise what we call the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church, with all its diverse parts, um, with Christ uh, at its head, right? And so that's pretty much church. So. But uh, when we talk about the doctrine of church, um, we're looking a little bit at the nature, organization, uh, function of the church, and, and some church uh, sacraments and some principles. So basically the term ecclesiology comes from the Greek ecclesia, that means assembly or church. And so the English um, part we add at the end is logi, so ecclesiology therefore ecclesiology ecclesiology <laughs> that was the theological part for today so anyways uh, that's the doctrine or the teaching of the church and um, what does the bible tell us about the church um, as you had uh, hopefully done your homework right you looked at uh, acts 2 1 to 21 is the uh, body of christ the body of believers in christ coming together uh, at Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit is released to all Christians. Um, Acts chapter 2, 1 to 21. So we see already here there is a missional part of the church, right? So church is also about mission. And um, the, um, the term that the word church, as you go through the uh, New Testament, is relatively uncommon, just, just to be aware of that from the from the Greek <coughs> ecclesia, the more uh, the more popular, prominent use uh, uh, of uh, how the early believing community, the church, uh, was referred to, was called the way, which is um, hodos, 
Uros means way, right? And um, the term, you know, we, we, we call ourselves believers, Christians, we call ourselves Christians, is rare, but it does appear uh, for the first time in Acts 11.26. So those are just some different uh, things to consider. And um, we wonder how the um, early church, as it begins after Pentecost, after Jesus uh, rose and ascended into heaven, how does it operate? So um, there are um, several parts we could consider, and I, I think we should consider, is when we look at the events surrounding the, uh, how, how the church comes into being, and that is the, um, the sense of people, um, you know, pretending to be followers of Christ or, or not, or like false disciples. That's the judgment of uh, Ananias and Zephyr in Acts 5.11. Well, we do not know if they were, the Bible doesn't tell us if they were believers or not. They, um, they were held accountable for their, um, for their actions. So, but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking specifically for false disciples. In other words, people who pretend to be followers of Jesus or Christians, uh, in contrast to we can't exactly establish it with Ananias and Zephyr, but the Bible tells us, uh, this is a very, very big one, um, that the Bible warns us about uh, uh, false disciples. So here's our Lord's words, Jesus tells us. So please listen in. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. God bless the reading of his word. This is Matthew uh, chapter 7, 21, 23. It's a very stern warning we want to consider as believers um, to understand that there are false um, believers, right? So <clears throat> there's other parts um, between um, that, that uh, tell us about true and false believers. Um, really, they are, they are only believers and unbelievers at the end of it all, but there's a call to unity among believers. So people who are genuinely in it for this, their hearts are bent towards Christ and they know, like all of us, um, as believers, that we will be held accountable before our Lord Jesus Christ uh, on Judgment Day as he returns, right? So we want to make sure that we don't pretend to be anything that we're not, not with God's help, all right? So unity is really um, a big part of the believing co uh, community, and um, the church really refers to all true believers or all believers forever. So there's a what we call an invisible church and a visible church. What does that mean? What does it mean? There's an invisible and, and the visible church. So um, it's interesting. While the church is invisible, it is at the same time simultaneously uh, visible. What does that mean? So um, the invisible church is the way God, namely our Lord Jesus Christ, sees the church. That is all people's hearts, right? That's the invisible church it may be invisible to us but it's not to our lord jesus because he sees every, everybody's hearts uh, that are either bent towards him or not that's the invisible church then the visible church is the church um as believers we see and experience it right so um right people we can see so um that is that there's a difference between the invisible and visible church and so here's a big one the bible tells us that there will always be uh, unbelievers among true believers right there are some verses there in the in the uh, article for you right unfortunately but that's the bible tells us there will always be unbelievers among the um, uh, the believers so that's in matthew 7 uh, verses 15 to 16 and Acts 20, 29 to 30.
So there's also something that we can consider is called um, we can uh, distinguish between a local and universal church. So what that means is um, church in the New Testament um, may refer to um, really uh, a group of believers that's relatively small. So they gather in a in a, in a private home uh, or, or a small house or you know a tent or whatever, and that's what we call local church, right? However, all uh, all believers uh, anywhere in the world, uh, wherever they may be. Um, it's called that's the universal church all right so there's a distinction there so um there is different kinds of the way um uh, churches are governed in other words people looking after uh the flock uh, who, are, who are leaders elders and pastors and churches and um, the bible gives us here uh, important rules that must be followed um uh, why? Because we want to establish and maintain a spiritually healthy church, right? So we have to um, make sure we um, follow God's word here. And there are different, there are different um, church offices, or you can also say positions, and um, there are different types that, um, uh, of offices that the Bible reveals. So uh, people who are called to look after the body of Christ are effectively good shepherds, or should be, right? So not hired hands, but good shepherds. And so there's different kinds. Um, there's uh, what is called um, uh, presbyters and overseers, right? That's what the Bible tells us. Presbyters are um, people who are, um, they're, they're made, they mature, they mature in their faith and, and dignified as part of their authority, and they're supposed to be treated with respect. And they themselves also must not be oppressive, right, um, or be mean to others, right, for example, or um, whatever it may be. So they have their certain specific things that the Bible tells us, many verses, it's in the article, look them up, and there's also um, overseers. Um, Overseers are basically good shepherds. They nurture, feed the flock. That is a group of believers, the body of Christ, right? Um, and they do. Um, they have a, like an emphasis, an emphasis on work. Like they do certain things. Just very, just very general. All right. So um, the um, the highest uh, offices um, that can be held are. Um, elders or ministers, right, in, in the in the Christian church. So, um, what are what are elders? So, to be an elder in the church, um, there's certain requirements. So, the specific duties that the Bible tells us. So, uh, for example, there's teaching, there's leadership, and especially um, sound teaching and doctrine. And that's in Titus one nine. So, an elder in a church will um, promote and uh, look after sound teaching and doctrine. So this is a very big one, all right, because there's a whole lot of, um, um, well, uh, I don't want to say untrue, but false uh, um, or, or people who don't affirm Jesus as God in the flesh. So those are not true churches, all right? So sound teaching doctrine must affirm, for example, uh, the deity of Christ. So very simply, that Jesus is God. Right? We say Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, and um, that um, we are saved through Jesus' um, work on the cross. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. It's very important too. The resurrection of Christ has to be maintained, and um, we have to be... Um, also, on the lookout, as Paul warns us, that uh, God's word is not to be um, uh, changed or altered in any which way. In other words, we don't we we hold to God's word as absolutely true, and absolutely true it is from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, and that the um, that there not be any uh, false gospels. So here's a warning from Paul, who writes. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, 
let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. God bless me on this word. So Galatians 1 uh, verses 8 to 9, very important. So the pure gospel or the essence, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that uh, Jesus died on the cross for sinners, for, for all mankind. And um, his, in his resurrection uh, leads to, ev uh, to everlasting life as we place our faith in him with repentant hearts. So that's central to the, to the Christian faith, right? And there's only one God, right? His name is Jesus Christ, right? The Holy Trinity has to be affirmed too. There's one and only one true living God who coexists uh, as one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So those, those are some things that must be affirmed. Um, uh, otherwise, it's not sound uh, doctrines, all right? So there's different other uh, positions, offices, uh, which I'm not going to go uh, further into detail. There, It's on the article there. Um, uh, deacons, they are called deacons from elders. They're, we talked about elders uh, who are God willing, teaching sound doctrine. And we move on to deacons, what uh, deacons do, all right? So it's important that we um, uh, we hold to uh, God's word as being inerrant. That means the Bible, uh, um, God's word, uh, is inerrant uh, because um, God is incapable of being wrong. So every God-fearing person, whoever they may be as believer, must respect, uh, honor, and hold to this, right? So that's very important. Uh, and um, so the role of an elder is to basically... Um, uh, publicly teach and provide oversight for the congregation, in other words, as a, an elder and leader. And um, as we read in Titus uh, 1, 5 to 9 in Acts 20, um, uh, this, uh, the office of elder is not um, uh, designated uh, for women. Now, the importance to understand here is that um, the Bible doesn't authorize um, um, women to serve as elder overseers um, because the um, the Bible basically tells us that that not be so. So if we honor God's word, the Bible, so we're looking at 1 Timothy 2, 12 to 14, and 1 Timothy 3, 15, for example, uh, there is a warning, the Bible warns us, that women are not supposed to take on the position of pastor and elder. Why is that? The reason is that um, as we go back to Genesis, there's a God-given created order that is um, then uh, manifested in the congregation uh, since Adam uh, was created first. All right. So, um, well, in the secular realm, or what society may say, um, they, they may have a different view of how you know, the church should be run or so. But um, just to, 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 to leave it short, uh, we, we do well to follow God's word. Um, actually, we should be thankful um, that God has given us clear instructions here because as believers who are led by the Holy Spirit, um, we, we're not going we're not going to challenge God's word in any way or, or put our own ideas uh, into something where it's not there, right? So... Um, at the worst, we don't want to deny Jesus as God in the flesh. And unfortunately, that is also something that is, um, you know, happens at times, right? So we, we pay for people that, um, that that not be the case. However, uh, since we are created as, as in God's image, male and female, we understand that um, God can use any um, a uh, God-fearing woman, for example, who understands and embraces the Bible and understands the specific roles and tasks, right, as led by the Holy Spirit, how God did design things, uh, she can be used mightily, amazingly, in many different kinds of different ways. So um, to be a good shepherd, right, to looking after the body of Christ 
in many other ways, right? Other than than uh, being a pastor, elder, just to, to him, if you were the communion mission, discipleship, assisting roles, and so much more, right? So so we want to do it by the book, and um, the um, the Bible is there to tell us these things, and uh, that's one of the things we want to also uh, uh, take to take to heart. So there's different kinds of church government, um, different Christian, you know, uh, denominations. You can look at that. I'm not going to cover that here, um, where the, um, you know, the decision-making process basically is um, located. So there's Episcopal, Presbyterian, and there's Congregational. All right. So Episcopal, Presbyterian, Congregational. And uh, there's a little bit more about that in the article. So um, uh, you can read about that there and I encourage you to. Uh -huh. It's very, very short. Those are the basic three different types. So what is the purpose of the church? Um, basically, um, we find the, um, the purpose of the church in, um, to, um, in the book of Acts. And that's Acts 2.42. And, it's, and uh, Luke writes there. Luke was the writer who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. God bless you, the honest word. Acts 2.42. So what does that mean? So we're, we're admonished to teach sound, Bible-based, christ -centered doctrine, coming together in fellowship, Right, God willing, if it's safe to do so, uh, sometimes there's, uh, you know, circumstances or health crisis or things that prevent us from coming together physically, but it can be done uh, in a non physical way. So people can still come together in a safe way, uh, even in times of crisis, uh, whatever that may be. Um, then um, we're supposed, su supposed to observe the Lord's Supper, also called the Eucharist and uh, perform baptism and pray together very important so um what really matters here is um that um any church that um, um where, where all the, the 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 basic essentials i just mentioned are not followed um and not done um, uh, may point to a uh, false church. So it looks like a church or a church building, but it's not. Um, because basically Christ is not acknowledged as God in the flesh. So um, that, is the, that is the key. And that is very important for us to, um, to understand. So that's not a true um, church. The main goal of a church is to f f fulfill the Great Commission. And that's what Jesus gives us to uh, fulfill. And it's in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. This is a big one. So listen in. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. God bless you, the Lord's word. So isn't that a wonderful um, encouragement here? Um, important is to understand the first thing Jesus says is, Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So in other words, uh, he's completely um, unlimited. He has all authority over all things, and it is through the person and power of the Holy Spirit that he calls us into um, this great commission as his followers uh, through the ages, right? So that's when we say we're missional, we're sharing the great commission. And um, that's one part of that. And part of this goal is always to help people grow in their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's pretty much what, ch what, what church is all about. It's not about rituals. It's not about, you know, this or that or something like somebody may think, oh, I go to church and that's how I get to heaven. No, as Jesus said, and right in the beginning, um, it's about people's disposition of heart towards him, right? People with a personal relationship with him. 
And uh, yeah, so as, as that, there's um, basically two, um, two ordinances, right? we call also known as sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So just some things I w would like you to encourage you to read the article and understand more. Uh, there's some verses there too, to what, uh, to uh, more about baptism and the Lord's Supper. So um, just some, um, to clear up a few misunderstandings, um, some people unfortunately think that uh, baptism in and by itself does something. So baptism in and by itself does not save a person. I repeat, baptism in and by itself does not save a person. 1 Peter 3, 21. Also, uh, importantly, uh, how it's done, um, either by, you know, how the water is applied to a person as they are baptized, in his speed, uh, you know, sprinkling or dripping or a person being fully immersed in the water, neither does that uh, uh, save, save a person, right? So, uh, just as a, just as something to think about is like, so, right, somebody, uh, somebody repents of their sins and um, they're on their way to be baptized and unfortunately uh, there's an accident or God calls them home before the baptism can occur. Is that person eternally saved? Yes, that's it, right? Um, because of a repentant heart uh, turned toward Jesus Christ, um, in that personal relationship so baptism is a sign those are those are um, uh, important um, signs that point to the new covenant that jesus has established so um, there's a lot more about that in the article i encourage you to reach that uh, to read that so um, the most important thing is that we understand that a person must understand um, and believe the gospel right the good news of jesus christ so um a key and proper understanding of baptism um is is, is part of this understanding as just as a sign it points to uh, to our lord jesus christ that we're basically crucified with christ uh, to say it to say it differently um the lord's supper right there's different views on the lord's supper how it's done it's uh, recorded in Acts 2, 46, 47. But again, um, the best, uh, the best Bible-based Christ-centered approach is to see it as a new covenant that points to, um, to uh, Jesus Christ. And um, any believers, right, we don't have to be in a, something that looks like a church building to do the sacraments or perform the Lord's Supper. Um, the important part is that we believe, understand, who Jesus is as God in the flesh and why he came to atone for our sins on the cross and believe in him, um, have faith in him and uh, his uh, atoning work on the cross. And that's pretty much it. So we celebrate the Lord's Supper and we examine ourselves. We, we um, you know, we, we, we ask the Holy Spirit to, to help us um, remain surrendered and humble, dependent, and if there's anything we have, some you know, some something the Spirit reveals, it's okay to pass on the Lord's Supper, and then maybe some another time they'll be there we can partake. But the Holy Spirit sometimes um, um, points us to, you know, guides us not to partake or take part in the whole, uh, Lord's Supper for whatever reason, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, but that's what we mean by examining ourselves. So. Um, yeah, so any any group of believers can come together, uh, followers of Jesus Christ, and do the Lord's Supper together. And um, it's in um, it's in the uh, uh, first book of Corinthians. Um, Paul um, gives us instructions. One Corinthians, one Corinthians chapter eleven, twenty three to twenty six. So that's uh, how to how to perform how to do the Lord's Supper. So um, yeah, so another part is that um, uh, we're called uh, to minister uh, in our, to our ministry. So it's a matter of the heart, and we we look after others as we just said, and so um, we do ministry to God and work as unto to God. 
and look after others, uh, fellow believers, but also people who may not have come to Christ yet. And that's where evangelism comes in, right? It's announcing the good news as Jesus commands. Um, yep, that's the Great Commission, right? And um, But being merciful, right? Kind and expressing God's grace, um, that's the best way to, um, to evangelize as we're doing that by the Holy Spirit. And um, discipleship is another aspect that's understanding really... Um, understanding the cost of following Jesus. Um, the Bible, the gospel of Jesus, is not some kind of a feel-good thing or, uh, you know, Jesus loves all people and so uh, uh, he, he loves me and everybody else and so everybody's happy and everything's wonderful. No, there's a cost to following Jesus and it's, there's a very harsh, very harsh truths and realities in the gospel that... Um, People even in, in in as people come to Christ that um, you know it says uh, and the world will hate you Jesus says and the world will hate you because you are my followers right but he says also says um, but remember it hated me first right as an encouragement but that's part of the cost of following Jesus and that you can read the, more about that in Luke fourteen twenty six to thirty um, so it's a call as his disciples to surrender ourselves to Christ wholeheartedly. And remain faithful to him, and uh, leading to you know uh, growing the body of Christ, the growing of the body of Christ. So, the goal is not to to get as many people like as possible, like for a numerical value, but just to witness to people, and that people can come uh, understand, learn about who Jesus is, why he came, and then come to saving faith. That's what it is all about, right? And. As we're on our, uh, lastly, on our mission, or being missional, or communicating Christianity to others, uh, that is mainly those uh, who, who may have never heard the gospel in the first place. So good. So that's basically the summary of what, uh, the very basic overview of what the church is all about. Um, um, there are many things that we uh, want to understand, that there are uh, false believers, effectively there are believers and unbelievers, right? So there really are no false believers. False believers are people who pretend to be believers, but they're not. And some people, some churches are false uh, churches in the sense that they don't, uh, for example, they don't uh, teach and preach Christ crucified and don't acknowledge Jesus as God in the flesh. So those are churches um, that we um, want to stay away from. Um, because the Bible warns us uh, about uh, uh, false teachers, right? So as we we had we read this Matthew seven, uh, fifteen to twenty, and also what we already what we, we read in Second Peter uh, chapter two. Second Peter, the second letter of Peter in the New Testament, chapter two is all about um, false teachers, right? And so we want to avoid false teachers, false disciples. And the way to do that is to, uh, to, to be in the Bible and um, stay close to Jesus and in prayer and praise and in his word. And the Holy Spirit will uh, help us to uh, discern true and false. Uh, that's one of his tasks and jobs, right, as believers, as Christians. So we, um, we are called to stay in the word. And the more time we spend in the word, um, the easier it will be for the Holy Spirit to help us, um, to reveal to us, uh, you know, who is in it for Christ and who is not. And, um, right, it tells us the Bible we will recognize uh, them by their fruit, right? Just as an example, Jesus says, um, um, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit and the bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So that's the difference between the uh, believer, unbeliever. Um, um, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So Jesus gives us encouragement there. Good. So as we are looking at now coming to the end times, the last things, that is eschatology, right? the, 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 the teaching the doctrine of the last things, literally the last things. As Jesus returns, this is a homework. Um, read the book of Revelation, that is the last book in the New Testament, 
the book of Revelation, um, also known as Apocalypse, the, um, um, that's a concentrated effort, right? You, you, you can read it all in one go, there's 22 chapters, um, and pay special attention um, not to what you may not understand, because there's a lot in there that it's hard to understand for us because we're dealing with a letter. It's a letter that is written. The Apostle John wrote to uh, specific church communities as a warning. So a lot of the visions that are there following chapter uh, uh, four and thereafter, um, are there's a lot of visions and, and symbolism and things in there. And um, so, so uh, read it, but uh, don't focus on what you may not understand, but what you can, and then there's, a, there's enough. So, um, yeah, so it's basically about, it's a, it's a letter that John is, uh, uh, Jesus gave to the Apostle John to warn the churches, uh, that's chapters 1 to 3, of their spiritual status, right? Some of them were, you know, uh, compromising, they were, uh, you know, being in the world and of the world and following worldly ideas and Jesus is warning them that uh, they are on their way to um, uh, um, to eternal damnation, pretty much, right? So there's um, so read that that's in chapters one to three. That's what Revelation is all about, but also about the uh, Jesus' promise for all of us that who persevere as believers. Chapter twenty one to twenty two is the new heavens and the new earth. So if you can't, or for whatever reason, uh, feel you don't want to read the entire uh, book of Revelation, um, do read chapters 1 to 3 and chapters 21 to 22. Um, so if you can't read the entire book at that point, no worries. But if you do, all the better. Um, the more time you spend in the Bible, uh, it's never wasted time. It's always time gained. All right. So, short prayer. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for this blessed day. Thank you for what you've revealed to us about the church and um, uh, how you uh, founded the church, how um, the church operates, and, and help us to discern between um, you know, people who, whose hearts are in, in and for, for Jesus Christ and those who are not unfortunately, and that we pray for those that people repent and turn to you while there's still time. Uh, remind us too that church is not a building, but it's a matter of heart. People start bent towards you and coming together as the body of Christ. That's what uh, church is, as you've revealed yourself to us in the Bible. We want to thank you for all of this, and we love you and praise you, Lord Jesus, in your holy name we pray. Amen. And always remember, the best Bible is an open Bible. Please join again soon.